started, yes. Uh, we'll just get started right now, and we are going to present Chino Police Explorer Eddie Monubian. All right. And if everyone can please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Everyone put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Eddie. You did a great job. And so next, we will be having our Chino Police Chief, uh, Karen Comstock, to start with our welcome. Police Chief. Good morning, Saul. Uh, I, I don't need a microphone to be heard. I'm pretty used to it my whole career. <laughs> welcome to the Chino Police Department. Uh, this beautiful new facility has been in the home of the Chino Police Department now for approximately three years. But what's particularly important today is your interest in what's going to happen here for us in January or February, which is El Nino. El Nino is coming. Um, think about what you could do if you had two or three months to plan for something. Well, that's exactly what we have here. We have time to plan for all of this water that's going to come to specifically our region, land here, and in preparation for that, what you all can do at your houses and your businesses to make this a successful event for all of us. And the number one thing during this weather pattern is the protection of lives. So I want to talk to you about a couple of things just real quick, and I'm going to turn it over to the rest of the speakers. The city of Chino will be particularly impacted by this weather pattern because of where we're located geographically. We're sort of the funnel point. You're going to hear a lot more, a lot smarter people than I talk about this today. Where all this water coming from Big Bear and every place else is going to come here to the Prado Dam. And then what I tell people is our job is to, look, to deliver it safely into Orange County, right? <laughs> so, um, and doing that is, uh, yeah, is not always such an easy event. So uh, uh, what a lot of people don't understand is all of our storm drains and other things are going to reach a capacity. And they're not going to be able to take any more water, including our land. So uh, unless you're a planner or an engineer, w the next thing that is designed to transport water is our roadways. Our roadways are designed to take that water and move it, keep it moving in a direction where we want to go. We consider any flooding event successful when we don't impact houses or structures or parking structures. So we keep all that water away from your homes and other things and we get it to where it belongs safely, we consider that a success. So I want to tell you all thank you for coming here today to learn more about what you can do to prepare in order to, 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 uh, to uh, get us through this event. We're going to survive the event, we're going to get through it. It may be a little chaotic at moments, but we're going to get through it. What's important is everybody stay calm, be educated today about what you can do in order to prepare for it, which includes, it includes, hey, you may not be able to get to work one day, right, because of this flooding. Have a plan in advance for your job, for your boss, for your children, for everybody. If, if because it's, it's not just going to impact your area, it's going to impact us region-wide, and we all know what happens in Southern California to every roadway once it rains, right? So have a plan in advance. Thank you all for being here today. I'll turn it back over to Saul. Right, Saul. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next on the agenda, we have Assemblymember Freddy Rodriguez, Rodriguez from District 52 with a few remarks and an introduction. Thank you. Wow, what a great turnout here in Chino. I want to thank everybody for coming out and participating in this very useful seminar. I want to thank the Congresswoman for bringing us all together with this, as the Chief just stated. You know, El Nino is real, it's going to be happening, but we have time to prepare ourselves for it. There's many resources here available to you, and my biggest thing that, that I represent you in the state of California, I sit on two select committees, Emergency Management and Local Emergency Preparedness, and I'll be strong to make sure that we are aware of any dangers that we prepare, prepare ourselves. Look at California, look what we're prone to. Fires, earthquakes, 
floods, just like we're going to be talking about today. So we need to prepare ourselves. I hate to come across people and say, well, I didn't know about this. I didn't know where to go. Well, that's why the congresswoman is having events like this right here in our backyard to tell us, give us that information so that we can go back to our neighborhoods, our streets, and let people know that, hey, I'm going to be prepared. I went to this event, and guess what? We need, we all need to be prepared because every city, every street is going to be different. I just recently had a meeting with all of my city managers in the cities I represent to talk about what are you going to prepare yourself for El Nino? Because I want to know about it now that we have time to prepare ourselves. Let me know if I need Caltrans, conservation crops there to help clean up some of these storm drains, clean up some of these areas that have been overlooked and neglected. Because I would hate to see that we have this big storm come and guess what? We weren't prepared. Let's start ahead now. And with that, before I introduce the congresswoman, I want to uh, introduce a couple of electives that are with us here today. Councilmember Bill Roof from the City of Montclair. Alan Walker, Councilman from Ontario. And we have Rafa Trujillo from the West Valley Water District. So with that again, I want to introduce their Congresswoman Norma Torres for bringing us all together. With that, Norma. Uh, creating uh, 
um, problems not only inside but maybe down the road when mold begins to form within the walls. You want to try to avoid as much of that as possible. Um, something that I did myself this week is I called, I contacted my insurance company and I got a quote of flood insurance. I looked at the map and I do not live in a flood zone, but I, you know, I want to make sure that if, if uh, the runoff is so much that my, my streets are going to be flooded, I want to make sure that that water doesn't come into my home. And there is a 30-day waiting period. So if you buy insurance today, you would not be able to file a claim for 30 days. You cannot make payments, so you have to pay you know, that insurance premium up front. So start thinking about those things uh, to prepare yourself. Uh, later on, if you want to cancel um, that insurance, if you feel you don't need it anymore, you know, I'd rather do that. I'd rather cancel six months from now, but be prepared today. Um, you know, my pets are like my family, so I'm making sure that there is a plan for them. If nobody's going to be home, that a neighbor is able to take care of them or bring them uh, into their, their home. Um, if, Nobody is going to be at my house to do that. So, you know, we urge you to start thinking about what you can do to help yourselves in your neighborhood. Introduce yourselves to your neighbors if you don't know every, all of them. Um, know where your nurses live in your community. Know where uh, your doctors live in your community. I lived in Pomona during um, a, uh, an earthquake. Our lights were out for a week. Thank God that one of our neighbors had not one, but they had two, um, what are they called, generators. And he used, that neighbor used one generator and allowed the whole you know, block to use it for one hour a day. One hour is enough to keep your refrigerator, the food inside your refrigerator uh, cool and your freezer um, goods frozen. So, you know, we were in good shape because of his assistance. Know who lives next door and know where you can go for help. Know where your fire station is. Know where the fire department um, is, is located. How many people in here consider themselves strong swimmers? Good for you, I'm not that good of a swimmer. Um, I want to suggest something to you. I don't care how strong a swimmer you are. Stay away from the flood control channel. That is not the type of water that you can swim in. Not only is it polluted, but the force that it comes down, you cannot visibly see that force. And the last thing we want is for uh, one of our first responders to be injured because they're trying to save you. Um, we, you know, those are all avoidable incidents. So. Um, please start thinking about those things, start talking about all those um, things uh, with, with your um, children and the people in your community. I want to introduce our next uh, guest, Noah. Mr. Noah himself. Thank you so much for coming out here. Mr. Tardy. <laughs> Mr. Tardy is going to take. operation. What you see up on the screen here are some of the main duties that we do. 
I'm here to talk primarily about El Nino, but I wanted you to be familiar with what we do because when it rains or when it snows or when it's windy, we're the ones providing the weather information directly to media, emergency managers, and the general public. We provide them directly either through the internet or now with new technology, you probably receive them through your phone. Perhaps you've got a flash flood warning on your phone. Perhaps you've got an amber alert on your phone. Those amber alerts come directly from California Highway Patrol in Sacramento to us, the National Weather Service, and we can send them to your phone. So depending on where you are, those type of warnings are geo-targeted to go exactly to the cell towers that are affected. It's a pretty powerful technology. We also provide weather forecasts directly to fire agencies. We have a lot of wildfires down here. And those weather forecasts go directly to the managers that need to make decisions about how strong the wind's gonna be, what they need to do, how much resources they need to bring in, and so forth. Now also our agency, we're the ones that issue El Nino advisories, El Nino updates, and we're gonna go into a lot of detail on that in the next uh, few slides. The daily forecast, partly cloudy, 75 degrees, we also produce those out in seven days. Weather.gov is the page where you would find all that information, weather.gov, simple to find. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. So everything that I'm showing here, we also share on Facebook, Twitter, and recorded videos on YouTube as well. So a lot of information, easiest to find it just at weather.gov. I do have a table over here not staff because I'm standing here. That table has a lot of information, the latest information about El Nino, and also weather apps for your phone. So be sure to check that out. What is El Nino? Some of you probably have ideas of what it is or what it isn't, you've heard a lot on TV. It's not rain, it's not rain, it's not a storm. What El Nino is, is warm ocean temperatures in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. How can that affect our weather up here? way down south of Hawaii. When that water gets very warm, it changes our jet stream. The jet stream is that red ribbon from west to east. It's the most powerful jet stream in the world, but usually it's not affecting us. It pays an occasional visit. The past four years, it hasn't been here really at all. Usually it's going across Oregon and Washington. What El Nino does is it draws it further south. It draws it further south. So we have like temporary climate change, if you will, just for the winter when El Nino gets very strong. Here's what it looks like. The red is what we typically see from a strong El Nino. Not only does it draw it south, it brings it right here in Chino, right in far southern California and northern Mexico. Normally it's much further north. It only pays a visit occasionally. So the important thing with El Nino is not to think of, okay, when's it coming, or, or when's that big storm going to hit? It's many storms. It's the jet stream. The jet stream is where the airplanes fly, and that's what also brings in all of our storms. Okay? So what El Nino can do is bring us many storms, frequent storms, the cumulative impact of all those storms. That's what really can get us, as Norman was explaining very nicely. What else is going on? So the El Nino zone is way south of Hawaii. How can something like that affect us? Well, the oceans contain all the energy and moisture in our planet. That's why hurricanes can be so powerful. The oceans are really what drives our atmosphere. We have other things going on, though. The so-called blob areas, I know, not the best word, but at least you'll remember what it is. Those blob areas will explain a little bit where those came from and how they might interact with the El Nino zone. So remember, El Nino is warm ocean temperatures. It's not global warming, though. It happens every three to seven years. It happens every three to seven years, at least El Nino does. We've had a crazy summer. So we had more rain between July and September, more rain between July and September than we did last year between January and April. More rain. We've been very humid, you might have noticed, very warm. The electricity bill might have been a little high. Mine was. We can directly attribute that to our ocean temperatures, not in El Nino zone, but just off the coast, the California Bight. Blob one, blob two. We can directly attribute all that warmth in the ocean has 
at least temporarily, changed our climate and given us very warm, muggy conditions and even rainfall from remnants of tropical systems. We've been right on the axis of that, even before El Nino became as strong as it is now. We've been right on the axis of that over the summer. Take a look at some of these staggering numbers here. So the coast of California, which extends into the Inland Empire a little bit, the month of October was record-breaking. We can attribute that all to our ocean temperatures in the California Bight being much above normal. I won't go into the exact numbers, but we shattered records on the coast that were old. Records, usually you beat them by a couple decimal points. We beat them by a couple degrees. And this has been a broken record. Take a look at our region over the past four years. We have not seen a warmer period. And the reason why I'm showing some of this before I jump into El Nino is pay attention to these extremes and how extreme they are. Second place is not even close. This is an average of temperature over the past four years. First place. Not necessarily first place you want to be in. The drought, we've been talking about the drought since we're, we're blue in the face talking about the drought. It's been four years running. But it's extremely serious because the whole state of California is missing 27 inches of rain everywhere. You average it all together. That's over two feet of water over the whole state missing. We just didn't get it because the storm track was avoiding us for the past four years. How much was it avoiding us? Over the past four years, our region here, we're right on the edge of the heart of the drought. Our region has only received two seasons out of four. So we're missing two seasons. It's as if two winters didn't occur. And you know how our winters work. That's where we get all our precipitation almost entirely outside of a thunderstorm in the desert during the monsoon. So that is huge deficit, huge impact. This is what you think of with El Nino, right? And this is what we're likely going to see, at least in parts of Southern California, because of what we're dealing with. It's not a matter of where El Nino is, when will it come, has it formed, it's there. And I'll show you some slides that show you how strong it really is. How does El Nino form? Here's a little 101 with El Nino. That's all you need to know. So in the Western Pacific, that's where the water is really warm, usually all the time, tropical Pacific. A lot of hurricanes form there, a lot of thunderstorms. The way weather works is when you get too much of a good thing, you get too much warmth, too much cold, too much wet, too much dry, the atmosphere compensates, just like high and low pressure. Wind blows from high to low pressure. When you have too much warmth there, it builds up and eventually spills over. And that overwhelms our normal trade winds along the equator. And that allows you to get that perfectly, almost perfectly shaped El Nino zone, okay? That hits South America and then spreads apart, just like you were to spill water and hit the wall and spread apart and then settle into a spot. And that is the area that we focus on when it comes to El Nino and changing our weather pattern. It occurs, like I said, every three to seven years. California is not the only place it impacts, it's a global impact. It's been a long time, like Norma said, since we've seen rain. Long time. Some of you, it may be five years, December 2010. Others, it might be in the mid-90s, depending on where you live. It's been a long time since we've seen too much rain and a lot of flooding. We don't remember things like that. We might have moved. Things might be new. Infrastructure might have changed. Lots of things. One thing to keep in mind with El Nino, and it'll get a little confusing as we get through the winter and next spring, not all El Ninos are the same. So we can't say, OK, this El Nino is this, so we'll get this much rain. This El Nino is that, so that area flooded last time, so that area flood again. It's not quite apples and apples. And in fact, our friends in Northern California, which we borrow a lot of water from, and the Colorado River, where we take a lot of water from, those areas are not guaranteed to get as significant amount of rain. So it's very likely we'll still be talking about this long-term deficit and drought in far Northern California. Yet down here, we could be under, literally, underwater. Take a look at this. So one myth of El Nino is that the only way we can get torrential rain is through El Nino. The yellow areas support that theory. The yellow areas say, wow, some of our wettest periods have come right from El Nino winters, OK? But then there's some caveats, just like with anything. There's always a few surprises. 
And those extreme storms don't almost necessarily occur with El Nino. So the point is that with El Nino, you get a lot of storms, and you can get a lot of rain, and that gives you impact. Now, the worst case scenario, if we were to get one of these other storms, these kind of random storms that we only know about seven to 10 days in advance, that could really give us a lot of problems. So we gotta prepare for what we know, and that's a lot of storms coming to the region. Not necessarily the biggest storm ever, but a lot of storms that can accumulate. When your soils get saturated, they can't take as much water. Things start to move, slide, rivers fill up, okay? And it only takes maybe a smaller storm to really put you over the top when you get in that scenario. And across California, it's been all over the place with El Nino. So understand that in far northern California, and even in the northern Great Basin, where a lot of our water it comes from, those regions will still suffer from drought and may not get out of the drought because historically, other El Ninos have not delivered wet weather across the entire state. But us here in Southern California, we do have the best correlation, like I'll show you in a couple slides. Now, there are some years to look at that we can compare to. 82, 83, you might remember that year. That is the benchmark for California. That's the wettest year ever in California, the biggest snowpack, biggest snowpack. So that's like the textbook El Nino year. 97, 98 wasn't too far off. We were a little better prepared that year. That was really the first year where we really had a handle on what is El Nino and what can it do. But the point is, there are only a couple years that are now comparable in terms of the strength of what we're looking at with this current El Nino in the Central Pacific Ocean. And those are the two years. Now, in order to really benefit the whole state, we have a lot of precipitation we need. We need a big deficit we need to make up for. We need big snowpack, but the correlation with Southern California is very good. On the left is what El Nino uh, sorry, on the left is what the past two winters have been. The jet streams completely missed us. On the right is what El Nino usually does. Strong ones. Direct hit. Direct hit. On the left is the atmosphere. Like flight level. Like we were, we were going in an aircraft from Ontario Airport. Look how warm the atmosphere has been because of the lack of storms. Ah, that's where our blob came from. So our atmosphere got so warm because we didn't have any storms turning up the ocean, direct sunshine, no upwelling, that the oceans, which are really hard to warm, warmed up directly under those warm areas. On the right, that's El Nino, strong El Nino. Complete opposite. So we are potentially going from 180 degrees, complete opposite. Now before El Nino formed, on the left-hand side, the blob was already there because that resulted from lack of storms. On the right is usually what we deal with. So why do we care about the blob on the left-hand side? Because now we have this. Now we have the El Nino zone, and we have this extremely warm water in the California Bight and the Mexico Baja. Why does warm water matter? Just like hurricanes, Pacific storms love warm water. And we're already seeing the impacts like we saw last Tuesday with the thunderstorms that came off the California Bight. So very rare to get thunderstorms in the winter in Southern California. That warm water aggravates the atmosphere. The El Nino zone aggravates the jet stream. The two together can bring you some big rain. Here's what your textbook would show. Typically, our region and Southern Texas and Florida, those are the areas that have the best correlation to strong El Nino, the far south. So we're in it. If you want to have the best correlation to El Nino, you're in the right spot. Our two big years, well, those were just ideal. If we can get a year like that, which is not guaranteed, even our drought-stricken Northern California will benefit tremendously and pull them out. But no one's writing that one off yet because that drought is very, very defi uh, long-term deficits. Our friends at University of California, San Diego Script summed it all up. The blue areas are where you have the best correlation, rain and El Nino. Rain and El Nino, the blue areas on the left. The center image is, okay, what about the biggest storms ever? The baddest ones, like 1993. If you're in the white, that means you don't really have a relationship. So our mountains out here have seen some of their bigger rains in non-El Nino years. But we've seen most of our rain, the blue areas, in El Nino years, okay? So it's not necessarily the worst 
most devastating storm. It's a lot of storms. It's a long winter. This is what typically happens. We've got a couple more slides, and I'll wrap it up. This is typically what happens. As we go into December, and January, and February, the jet stream starts to sag down because it's responding to that warm ocean temperature. It's like, whoa, what's all this warm water doing here? All the jet stream is is the difference between cold air to the north, warm air to the south. That's your jet stream. The important thing to note here is come December, and you have all had a lot of rain, maybe you had a few storms, the biggest impact tends to be February and March, the latter half of the winter. It takes the atmosphere a while to engage with the ocean temperature. Once it locks in, it's hard to break it down. How strong is El Nino? If we were to close the books right now with El Nino, it is the strongest on record. And it's important that it continues to be strong because we need it to be strong in the heart of the winter when the storm track and jet stream is most active. How do we know it's going to last into the winter? When we look deep down in the ocean, deep down in the ocean, there's a lot of warm water, a reservoir of warm water that will come to the top over the next couple months to keep it very strong. The average of the heart of El Nino now is 2.7 Celsius. Doesn't sound like a big number for oceans huge. Over 5 Fahrenheit. That measurement of El Nino exceeds what we saw in 97, 98, which was the strongest at the time. So the theme, the driest, the warmest, the strongest El Nino. We have the theme over the past few years of really pushing the limits on extremes. Here's the forecast in the last couple slides. Our region is the heart of where we expect the most precipitation from all those storms. Good news is we'll have a little relief from the extreme heat because we'll have a lot of clouds. A lot of clouds, a lot of rain. Pacific Northwest, our friends up there, they're in it for the long haul. They already have a bad drought, a bad fire weather season, but they're in for the California type of drought because we're going to take their storm track and their jet stream and borrow it for the winter. Here's a zoomed up version, and look, it's not just our coast, it's not just our mountains, it's our deserts, it's our desert areas as well, where we're going to see a lot of precipitation, especially January through March. I have a slide deck over here that's printed out so you don't have to go over all these. The bottom line is El Nino is here. It's record breaking already. If it sustains itself, it'll be the strongest on record. What you want to know is the impacts. What will the impacts be? And historically, the impacts are a lot of storms, frequent, an extended winter. We haven't seen extended, we're talking about fire weather in March and April, an extended winter all the way through March and April. When you have a lot of storms, you have a lot of accumulative impacts and things start to happen with saturated soil, despite this big drought we've been in. So it's a real phenomenon, it's really going on, and the theme of extremes has really taken over in California. Okay? And this is going to be a winter that really tests us because we have not seen all these ingredients line up like this in the past. Here's my last slide. And some of the good news is we'll have a good snowpack in our mountains. But the bad news is we're going to test areas that haven't seen a lot of water for a long time. Okay? We're going to fill up small reservoirs. We're going to test the rivers and so forth. I'm not going to talk any detail about it. Norman did a great job about the flood insurance. Check it out. There's free information online if you're in FEMA floodplain or if you need hazard uh, insurance added to your homeowner insurance that includes flood coverage. Weather.gov is all you have to remember. If you love El Nino, which a couple of you might, you can get updates in the link at the bottom there from the Climate Prediction Center part of NOAA. If you just want to get the forecast for the next seven days, tell me when it's going to rain or when it's not going to rain, weather.gov, and also on social media, prefer that versus weather.gov. Thanks, everyone.
She's on his way, so he will be here. Now we're going to introduce um, Veronica Verde from FEMA. She could come on up. And again, please raise your hand if you have your questions. And we're going to allow about half an hour for the public to to stop and talk to folks at, at the great resource tables to get a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So, Ms. Verde, thank you. Great. Congressman, uh, Congresswoman, for having us here today to talk about a really important subject, and that's uh, El Nino. Uh, but for FEMA, uh, we are always looking at a multi-hazard uh, preparation. We are ready to assist uh, the state uh, at a moment's notice uh, if there's a request from the governor, uh, dependent upon the impacts of storms or disasters in that particular area. So again, thank you again, Congresswoman, for having this important event and notifying individuals on how to prepare. So just a few uh, facts and figures about FEMA. Uh, FEMA was created in 1979 uh, by President Jimmy, Jimmy Carter uh, under an executive order, uh, and also under uh, 2003 Department of Homeland Security, and we became part of that family uh, with 22 other federal agencies. Uh, this has actually proven to be very effective because during disasters, Hurricane Sandy, um, we were able to tap into some of those resources, some of those federal resources, individuals that came out to help us, and also other uh, type of resources that they were able to uh, provide and assist us uh, during disasters. Uh, roughly, we have about 5,000 full-time employees. Uh, we have 6,000 on-call uh, disaster assistant employees that are ready to assist at a moment's notice. Uh, there are reserves program. There are actually our backbone of the agency and ready to assist uh, when there's actually a disaster that's been declared by the president. And we also have about 500 FEMA Corps volunteers. It's about a 10 month program uh, through the NCCC. Uh, young adults from 18 to 24 that come out and help us during the disaster uh, whenever there is one. And they also help us out in the region as well uh, to help us prepare uh, for events uh, such as El Nino. FEMA Region 9, uh, we actually have a large scale of uh, miles that we have to uh, look at. We have about 386,000 square miles, and it crosses the international uh, date line. Uh, about a few months ago, I was actually working in Saipan for a typhoon that hit there uh, a couple of months ago. And the importance of how preparation was for an island that can't go to a state next door for assistance is really key. Uh, so again, the whole theme of this should really be preparing and preparing yourselves for the next disaster, not only for El Nino, uh, but we also live in earthquake country. So a lot of the uh, different uh, publications that uh, we have um, over there on the table, we'll talk about how to prepare for a multi-hazard uh, disaster event in your state, in your community. So we have response programs. Um, we have operations, of planning, logistics, and communication. Uh, when there is a, a disaster event, uh, FEMA pushes out our incident management assistant teams. Um, we're there um, to support the state at a moment's notice. We are there uh, to be able to deploy within six hours, six to eight hours, to be on a plane uh, to go to that state uh, that is asking us for assistance. Uh, during uh, peacetime, we also have our, our regional watch center, who is always monitoring what's going on in our region and also throughout the country. What's the weather? What, what, what is actually being said in the media? Are there things that we need to always be looking at just to make sure that we're prepared? We're in constant communication with our uh, state agencies, our, our state governments, uh, just to make sure if something does happen, uh, we just pick up the phone and already start having uh, that conversation on what those needs may be. Just recently, a couple months ago, in the state of California, uh, there were two fires up, up north, uh, Lake County, Calaveras County, uh, burned over 1,500 homes. Uh, we were already monitoring the fire, provided uh, grants to help fight the fire, um, but it, 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 over, it overtook and it ended up burning down, burning down some of the homes down there, which led to a federal disaster declaration due to uh, the drought and so forth. Um, FEMA is ready at a moment's, again, moment's notice uh, to deploy resources uh, to the state uh, whenever there is a need, whenever there is a disaster declaration. Here in Southern California, uh, we have put together uh, Southern California a catastrophic plan. 
And it's actually based on the earthquake uh, in San Andreas Fault. Now are we susceptible to flooding, which is actually the number one disaster event uh, in the country, uh, but we are susceptible to earthquakes here as well. Uh, throughout the state of California, we've uh, pre-positioned resources uh, to assist uh, communities when there is that uh, disaster, when there is uh, that earthquake uh, here in California. So just quickly, just a few of our recovery programs. When there's a disaster declaration, uh, we do offer um, uh, monies for these are grants that you don't pay back for home repair, housing assistance, and other needs assistance. And that's basically for personal property, mental dent uh, medical, dental, and funeral when there's a disaster declaration. And then public assistance is more for local communities, for local government, where roads and bridges and recreational parks have been impacted as a result of an earthquake, uh, as a result of a disaster, excuse me. Hazard mitigation, um, that's another program that we have. Uh, what we do is we take 15% of the overall cost of a disaster and provide that to the state. The state administers that program for uh, basically uh, different types of projects. I mean, that's you know, building a larger firm, or if that's actually moving a floodplain town uh, to another site, or actually having to lift some of those homes that may be in a flood hazard risk area, you know, that's gonna be actually up to the state to look at some of those projects. Here in California, they have an enhanced mitigation plan, so they get 20% of the overall cost of that disaster. So El Nino history, um, just a few facts and figures. The strongest impact, as uh, we heard earlier from Mr. Tardy, um, in Southern California, 1997 and 1998. Uh, some of those impacts, December 6 through 8, um, in 1997, four inches to eight inches of rain in Orange County. And also there was widespread flooding in Corona and Victor Valley, uh, which brought upon some mud flows in Adelanto, if anybody's familiar with that area. In February 6th through 9th, uh, there was actually eight inches, eight, I think eight to three inches of rain in Newport Beach and Irvine as well. Uh, Newport Beach and Orange County uh, suffered some of the most substantial property damage. Um, February 23rd through 24th, uh, in 1998, two to five inches of rain in Southern California. $100 million worth of damages, and that also cost uh, two lives uh, during El Nino. So we heard a little bit already about the El Nino forecast. Um, it's not only going to impact uh, Region 9, which is part of California, Arizona, and Nevada. That's our area of responsibility in our region. And of course, the Pacific and the Pacific Islands. But it's actually going to uh, include um, the majority of uh, the states uh, here in the United States. So right now, throughout all of our regions, we are uh, doing preparations. We're doing a lot of events. Uh, we are doing a lot of uh, communication with our state partners uh, just to make sure that uh, we're in constant communication and also talking about preparation for El Nino. And I'll talk a little bit about how individuals can prepare for El Nino to come. So El Nino threat, increased flood, landslides, debris, runoff. Uh, there's been a lot of concern, um, especially like in the burn areas recently, the two counties of north, uh, to make sure that people are prepared. Uh, one is to make sure if, if, it, if they want to, to obtain flood insurance. Flood insurance is something earlier the Congresswoman has spoken about. There is a 30-day uh, wait period uh, to apply for flood insurance, but your homeowner's insurance does not cover any flooding. Um, I'm also gonna give you some websites at the very end that you can take a look at. You can actually plug in your address and it'll tell you uh, what flood has a risk area if you're in one. And uh, possibly um, also individuals and agents that you may call to obtain uh, flood insurance. So the use of NASA satellite observations, uh, just a few uh, things. Um, we've been working uh, with NASA to obtain some of the satellite uh, imaging just to see what those impacts are, are going to uh, look like. Um, we're also working uh, with uh, Region 9, our mitigation department is working with the U.S. Geological Survey and also California Geological Survey uh, to basically look at the effects and modeling of El Nino, uh, specifically for the San Gabriel Mountains because a few years ago there was a lot of fires in that area and they're very susceptible to uh, flooding up in the San Gabriel Mountains. 
Uh, the U.S. Forest Service right now, uh, they're actually doing a lot of outreach uh, to local government, uh, to communities, to talk about how they could uh, right now prepare for flooding. Uh, they're also looking at um, fire concerns in the community, so they're doing a lot of outreach now in the burn areas. Really quick, so California OES, Office of Emergency Services, which is our state counterpart, uh, they're already looking at those gaps, identifying some of their vulnerabilities, and already starting to look at planning and public education. Also looking at what kind of resources that they may need, along with local government, maybe extra sandbags, what, what other kind of resources may be needed uh, during the event. So FEMA preparation, uh, FEMA established the uh, LEM task force uh, during the summer. Uh, what we're doing uh, you know, right now is working really closely uh, with, uh, with NOAA uh, to get some of those facts and figures. We're also, again, working really closely uh, with the state of uh, California and also with the other states that we have. We're also working with our tribal our tribal members um, within California, we have approximately 103 uh, tribes, federally recognized tribes in California. So we're trying to do outreach with uh, them as well and uh, their community to talk about preparation. Uh, you know, one is, you know, what are their vulnerabilities? Have they identified their gaps? And what kind of resources will they need from FEMA um, when El Nino comes? Um, and if there is a federal disaster declared uh, disaster. I'm um, also wanted to, to prepare the community, uh, make sure that they also have uh, preparedness information on what they need to do. Um, obviously, the first thing is get an emergency kit. Uh, make sure that uh, you have a plan that's free. Talk to your family about where you're going to meet, how you're going to be reunited. If you're at work, if when this disaster happens, whether it's El Nino or an earthquake or a fire, how will you reunite and how will you get home? So these are things that are really important to start talking to your family about now. And also stay informed, so I'm going to give you a few websites. So what you should do to prepare, uh, again, as, uh, as stated by the Congresswoman, it's important to, um, if you're thinking about buying flood insurance, you actually have uh, 30 days of wait period for that flood insurance to take place, and your homeowner's insurance does not cover flooding. So if you look at floodsmart.gov, again, you can plug in your home. Uh, your address and it'll show you what kind of special flood hazard risk area, if any, you are in. And of course, provide you insurance agents where you can actually buy flood insurance. Mm -hmm. Ready.gov also provides publications. You can order these publications uh, free, um, especially if uh, you're interested in providing some information to schools um, and educating uh, individuals and communities. Or events like this that the Congresswoman has hosted today about how to prepare. Again, preparation should be for any event, um, El Nino, earthquakes and fires, we're all susceptible to this here in California. But the time is to prepare now. Uh, you want to know, uh, you know how you're going to reunite with your family, and you're going to want to know, you know, what are some of your risks. The Congresswoman had stated earlier, um, you know, know where, um, know where you need to go, know where your fire department is, you know, where your police department is. When the shelters that open up, know where that's going to be and know the addresses. The most important thing is, again, know where to reunite your family. I, again, I also have uh, the publications uh, that talks about all the multi-hazard disasters. Um, you know, ready.gov is a great place, again, to, to provide the publication. FEMA.gov, we're also providing updates on El Nino as well. Thank you very much. Of the history that occurred in 1997 and 1998. Um, as 
Uh, I was introduced, I, I was here uh, in 1998. I've actually been with Fire District since 1991. Uh, in 1997 and I was in a different position. I was actually a firefighter paramedic at the time, and my day was much different uh, then than it is now. Now I sit behind a desk and attend lots of meetings. Uh, then I responded to emergencies. So I do have some of the background, uh, some of the issues in 1997 98. Really, to sum it up, uh, at times it was overwhelming uh, from an emergency response standpoint. Uh, and what I mean by that, we were over overwhelmed uh, with the sheer call volume, more calls than resources available to respond to. Uh, and at that point, our dispatch center would start to triage the calls and send our resources to the most uh, threatening calls, meaning life safety issues first, and then prioritize them from there. So some of the issues we experienced, uh, widespread flooding of public streets, private property, uh, erosion of soil, uh, paved surfaces, we also had uh, roof collapses, both commercial buildings and also some on uh, private residences. Uh, lots of traffic collisions, a uh, huge number of traffic collisions and cars actually stranded as well that attempted to drive through uh, at what was standing water, but uh, oftentimes would drive through too quickly and uh, stall their engine and, and pull over to the side. Uh, lots of trees down, both in the roadway and on top of homes and just loss of electricity uh, for sometimes uh, several hours to a couple days. And uh, swift water rescues, we actually had a couple uh, rescues within our jurisdiction here in the south end of Chino, uh, where a family drove uh, leaving a, an event at El Prado Golf Course in the evening and attempted to drive what they thought was a road, and it was under normal conditions, but at that point it had actually turned into uh, what was a raging river and it took us uh, several hours to reach. It was a, a husband and wife, uh, and the lady was actually about eight months pregnant at the time, and we were successful in uh, getting her and her husband uh, back safely. Uh, but it does happen very, very quickly. So I, with that, uh, I just want to give you a couple tips. Um, obviously, prepare your home, and I think that's the message you've heard. There's going to be more information available for you there. Prepare your vehicle. Um, many of you like to commute to and from work. And oftentimes we don't think about the need to prepare our vehicles. So just some points, and this is specific to El Nino. Uh, make sure you have good walking shoes, especially ladies if you will wear heels to work. You do not want to get out in heels and have to walk uh, through mud and debris or any kind of distance. So make sure you have good walking shoes, some work gloves in case you have to move anything. Uh, another one, a tool to break the glass. And what I mean by that is to be able to break your windows. Uh, most vehicles now have power windows. If your vehicle loses power due to the engine stalling, whatever the issue is, you may not be able to open your windows. If you actually get stuck in moving water, the force of the water may prevent you from being able to open your door. If you have to get out of the vehicle, if things are, are changing to the point where you feel like it's no longer safe, you have to get out, you may need to break your window to be able to get out. Have some food and water in the vehicle as well. Uh, some rain gear, if you have to get out and walk, you want to stay as dry as possible. And also some warm clothes if you have to spend the night in your car. One other uh, important thing, uh, if you do stay in your car, your vehicle's running but you can't drive, use caution when keeping the motor running. Uh, you may do that for warmth, but just keep in mind that carbon monoxide poisoning may be an issue. If your vehicle's in an open area, uh, you're fine, but there is the potential that if the tailpipe's underwater or blocked with debris, that carbon monoxide will come into the uh, cab space of your vehicle and potentially be very harm harmful for you. Uh, don't drive through fast moving water. Even just a few inches of water is enough to sweep your vehicle away. Please be very cautious with that. Uh, and use good common sense uh, and have a plan. Most emergency situations, if you talk to people that survive legitimate life-threatening emergencies, they have a plan. Uh, if you are unfortunate enough to get in some circumstances where your vehicle's being swept away, things like that, have a plan, know another way out. Um, as Chief Comstock mentioned earlier, there may be days that you can't make it to work. Make sure that you have a plan uh, with your family, with your place of employment, things like that, and also know alternate routes. Uh, so many of us are creatures of habit, we drive the same way to and from work all the time. If those roads are not accessible for your vehicle, know alternate routes that you can take. So again, just to recap that we had widespread issues. Uh, the good news, both uh, Chino and Chino Hills have done a tremendous amount of work uh, addressing the flooding issues that we experienced in 97, 98 with much better drainage on some of those streets, 
uh, the infrastructure is there to support this, and planning is, in, is taking place in both cities. Uh, frequent meetings are occurring. They are prepared, but again, we have a limited number of resources. You need to prepare to take care of yourself and your family. Uh, the government cannot do that for everyone all the time. So please address the needs at your home with your family and uh, be safe. And again, it's coming. It's just a matter of time. Uh, please be prepared and be safe. And we'll, we have a booth on uh, over here on the left, my left and your right, and there's some information as far as uh, flooding safety and also some sandbag information as well. We'll be happy to address questions. I wish you later on. Thank you. Thank you. Very important tips. I wrote some down. <laughs> so we have, I have a staff of questions. We have about an hour, so I'm going to maybe we could do two minutes, about 20 minutes, and then I want you all to have an opportunity to go by and visit with the resource tables and talk to the Chino Fire District and San Bernardino County and FEMA. But, um, uh, so I'm going to start reading the questions off and looking at the professionals in the room. You could uh, jump in and feel free to answer. Um, so the first one, this could be FEMA or NOAA. If you live below a slope, what can be done now to secure the earth from moving? And what are warning signs that there's trouble with the slope? Or if it's weakening due to a storm? I, I think I would refer uh, the weakening of the slope mostly to local governments. Okay. Um, so I, I don't know if there's any more that talk about looking at of slopes or, or actually mitigating slopes. Okay. So that's more of, on a local level. Um, but you know what individuals can do now is you know start um, you know probably start looking at, at that preparation, maybe talking to you know your building department um, and kind of you know making those preparations. But that's mostly on a local level. Okay, great. Um, where can I purchase flood insurance? Where is it available? Uh, where is it available? Um, if you go to floodsmart.gov, uh, there's actually an 800 number. Um, and there's also agents that are available. You just plug in your address, and they'll provide you local uh, agents where you can purchase flood insurance. Um, <coughs> what is some good advice for homeowners that have pools in their, on their property during um, you know, I can address some of that. If you have a pool, a couple things. Make sure the drains around your pool are working. Hopefully those go to the front of the property or a lower area to move any of the standing water. Also, uh, have the ability to use your pump to lower the, the water in your pool. Um, we frequently had calls in that era uh, where the, the yard drains are backed up and the pool's overflowing and it's creating issues flooding into the house. So keep your yard, your yard drains uh, clean. Make sure that you have a pathway for the water. Much like Chief Comstock spoke earlier, as far as our roadways, there's a design that they have to move water from one point to another. Do the same thing with your yard. Know uh, if you have low spots or trouble areas and address those now. Um, oh, my glasses. Um, who do you report um, block streets, access streams that are um, causing street flooding in each city? Do you call your public works department? Yes. Contact your public works department. Um, they should be online. You should have um, a pamphlet maybe. You could call our office. We'll give you that phone number. Um, and then you can connect you with the, your public works department. Um, and I think this one, Noah, Mr. Carney, around what month will the majority of the rain come crashing down on us in Southern California? <laughs> like we talked about, each El Nino is a little bit different than the other, but historically, and some of those examples that were shown, is between March um, and January, so the latter half of the winter. But that doesn't mean we won't see significant storms in December, but those storms set the stage for more problems later in the year because they start saturating the soil. Right now, our soils are very dry, and water's not going to want to go into them. So initially, it's going to run off very quick, and then the soils are going to become more like a sponge, and that's when you start having additional problems with, with land moving and debris flow and so forth. The first places that will go will be the fire scars. They haven't really been tested. 
by any significant widespread rain. And then it will be other areas that are weaker slopes. But the area that we're really concerned about is the latter half of the winter, so between January and March. And this is for public Chino Valley Fire District and San Bernardino County Fire. Where, where, when and where can we get sandbags? I can speak on behalf of Chino Valley Fire. Actually, we have information in our booth. Uh, five or four of the stations. Okay, we, we just added one more station. So five of our seven stations, uh, two in Chino Hills and three in the city of Chino. We provide uh, sand and sandbags to residents. Uh, it's in conjunction with both cities. Uh, we, the fire district keeps spare the sandbags, the cities provide the sand. Uh, we do try to limit that to 25 uh, per residence. Obviously, if you have a very significant issue, it's going to take more than 25 sandbags to address that. But again, uh, we cannot, uh, we are not uh, able to provide numerous sandbags to every resident of the Chino Valley. So this is more for an emergency, kind of a stopgap to help divert water. Uh, there's also, and I believe we have some information on where you can actually purchase some as well. I'm hoping that some of our local retailers, like Lowe's and Home Depot, uh, will bring those on board and offer those for sale to the public. Yes, ma'am. In respect to that, is there any qualifications required to uh, be able to get the sandbags? No, we just ask that if you're a resident of the Chino Valley area, Chino or Chino Hills, uh, we'll provide those sandbags to you. Uh, we do not have sufficient staff uh, at those locations, especially to help fill all those sandbags. If the personnel are there and someone needs a lot of assistance, we can we will offer that. Uh, again, if they're not out responding to emergencies, they would be available to do that. Keep in mind the sand is very, very heavy. Uh, one of the, the issues, people will come, they'll fill the bags on their own, and they'll try to fill the entire sandbag. And you can see the one on the uh, table over there. Uh, they'll try to fill that up three quarters of the way with sand. When that happens, you cannot move that. Uh, and the same thing, people will come and get 15 to 20 bags, and then they have a small vehicle, a Honda Accord, a Toyota Prius, um, and it's not designed to take that kind of weight. Keep in mind, it's very, very heavy, so just use caution with that, and if at all possible, if you don't feel like you're up to the task physically, bring someone else with you that can help. Um. I think this one's for FEMA. Um, how do I find out um, how to find out flood risk zone of your home? Uh, is that online? Uh, the, the easiest way is to actually go online uh, www.floodsmart.gov. Um, there you can actually, as I stated earlier, you can actually plug in your address and it'll tell you what zone you are. Um, there's some zones that are higher risk, so the cost may be a little bit more. Uh, but for individuals uh, that are not in a high risk area, uh, insurance uh, cost may, may vary, it'll be lower. But if you go on floodsmart.gov, you'll be able to kind of plug in your address and find a local uh, uh, representative that can actually sell you our flood insurance. Um, this is for Noah. Um, with, with these coming storms, is it just rain or is it thunder and lightning? Is it dramatic wind or just <laughs> rain crashing down on us? And also, we have a question for the Inland Valley uh, Humane Society, who is here with tips on how to protect your pets and prepare for that as well. Any tips on how to protect my pet from thunder and lightning and preventing their escape from the storm? So you first. I love that question. Obviously, someone who really likes the weather or maybe hates the weather, but they know they're into the details. So, uh, believe it or not, because of the very warm waters, and we saw this even last week and, and what few storms we had last year, the storms of this winter, especially uh, some of the few storms that we see initially, are going to produce rainfall rates more than they might normally produce because of that warm California bite. So, yes, to answer your question, We'll see some unusual activity like lightning and maybe water spouts and maybe even a tornado, that type of thing. The atmosphere loves warm water, loves it. And it can make a big difference in enhancing it. So what it ends up doing is giving us heavier rainfall rates. And rainfall rate is really what causes most of our problems. Not a gentle rain that occurs over days or weeks. It's the rainfall rates, and those should be enhanced this year because of all that warm water along the California coast. Now this question, I wish I had a city manager here, because this is a city manager question. So I don't know if, if I have a brave soul that wants to respond to this, but, and, and I'm sure cities are, are working together, they are working together, um, but 
in your cities um, are the utilities, the electric companies, the, the water providers, the, the natural gas providers, um, telephone communications, the AT&Ts of Verizon, are they working together with our local cities to you know, create a plan? Mm -hmm. I can speak to this a little bit. Uh, in the back group, we actually have Chris Wolf from the city of Chino, and she has regular meetings with a wide variety of people in our area, everything from the school district, the gas company, to Edison, uh, to the prisons, to fire, police, and we work together regularly to establish good communication. So I know the large corporations uh, will be preparing to protect you know, the, the infrastructure that we need, uh, the cell towers, things like that, but again, these systems all can fail, so just be prepared. Sorry. And just to just address it like, uh, on a federal level, um, even for the Southern California Catastrophic Plan, we had over 1,500 stakeholders. Uh, we still continue to work with our private sector, and that would include utility companies, also uh, cell uh, companies as well, cell phone companies, and we're in constant communication with our state. Uh, we always do exercises uh, uh, with our state counterparts that does include our tribes, as well as um, you know, also some uh, local community uh, members that, that participate in some of those exercises as well. So it's year-round uh, that we keep in constant communication um, with those state territories and state governments. Great, I saw your hand. Can I ask you a question a little bit? But I mean, what exactly is being done to shore up the power system? I mean, yeah, you have a backup plan, but the power system. I don't know the answer to that. We, we did invite Southern California Edison and they were not able to attend. <laughs> but we can get your contact information and follow up with you um, and let you know and connect both of you together. Would that be all right? Great. I'm going to read one last question. I, I want to give you all an opportunity to grab some cookies and coffee and um, talk to these folks on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So in case I skip your question, I apologize. Um, and I have one more. Oh. Who would be the first contact um, in the event of uh, if we have an emergency? Do we still call 911? Do we call? I mean, can you explain? Maybe pick up the phone and call public works instead of 911. You know, that question is pretty broad. Um, so it comes back to really how you define an emergency. Right. And an emergency to me may be something dramatically different than it is to the, the people in attendance today. So if in doubt, call 911. Uh, you know, specifically if there's potential for it to be a life safety issue, an issue with uh, significant property loss, call 911. Um, worst case, they may put you on hold depending on what the circumstances are or provide you with another number to call. So don't hesitate. If there is an issue, please um, call 911 and we'll, we'll be able to figure out how to direct the call and handle it. Uh, there are some resources. If it's things like uh, flooded intersections, uh, there's there are tree down, trees down on sidewalks, things like that. We can direct those calls back through public works. Okay. Uh, but again, once the 911 operators are aware of them, we have systems in place to communicate back to the cities to address those needs. Great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. FEMA is looking at having individuals and communities empower themselves by preparing now, and this is why we're having this event that the congressman put together. So. Uh, it always starts with you. It's never just the federal government. Um, we are just the team. We're not the team. We're just part of the team. So we need everybody here in this room to uh, start making uh, those preparations now. Look at your emergency kit. It's uh, multi-hazard. It could be for flooding. It could also be for earthquakes. Uh, but start also talking with your family about how to prepare. Um, if you have children, start having those conversations at the schools about you know, how you're going to reunite uh, with, uh, with your family and with your children. Uh, if you work, find out how you're going to get home and start making those uh, preparations at work as well. If you're going to be there for a few days, even as a result of an earthquake, you know, do you have enough food supply, dry foods there at home? You know, for, for, the, for the ladies that wear high heels, you know, make sure that you have, you know, good walking shoes. And of course, already start making those preparations as well for your pets. Uh, if you have individuals that actually take medicine, already start having those conversations already, you know, with your doctors to see what they can prescribe. And if they can't, then make sure you write things down. We hold everything in our cell phone. But as we've seen in future disasters, 
um, that's going to happen. Not we're not always prepared with communication as far as electricity is concerned. Um, so make sure that you write things down. Important phone numbers. Write it down on a piece of paper. Write down uh, the type of medicine that you need to take, the dosage, and so forth, and put that in your emergency kit. Um, again, if you want to find out how to purchase flood insurance, you know, visit us at uh, floodsmart.gov. Floodsmart.gov also has a phone number, um, and that's 1-800-427-2419. Again, 1-800-427-2419. Uh, but if you can't remember uh, that phone number, if you don't have a pen, just visit us at fema.gov, and then you can actually uh, type in floods, and it'll direct you over to um, floodsmart.gov. Thank you. If you didn't write that down, you don't have the internet, call our office. We'll have the phone numbers for you. We'll probably have something on our website with contact numbers. I'm going to take one more question and I'm going to release you to the resource tables. Go ahead. Oh, I, I'm the one that asked the question about the animals, but oh. I just want to say because I remind everyone when there's thunder and lightning, they get scared. That's, they get scared and that's when they escape, just like a horse in yeah. July. Yes, we will. Well, thank you all for coming. All these nice folks are here with their information. Dr. Patrick just made it in. He's the gentleman from JPL NASA that coined the term Godzilla El Nino. So should we give him a few minutes to just talk about it? Good morning, everybody. I apologize, I got lost. What a rookie move, huh? How embarrassing. Okay, great. Okay, well, you know, we, uh, we have lived through some pretty interesting times here. You know, we've had one of the most punishing droughts in California history not just for the last four years, but really the last 15 years. And now all of a sudden, we're telling you that we're gonna whiplash you into unusually heavy rainfall, all right? A super El Nino. So it's going from a super drought, which has been punishing, and each and every one of us has felt it. And here comes XL El Nino. Yikes, yeah? Now, what we see here is a record of the four driest years, consecutive years, in Los Angeles history. And you can see that the last four years, the record goes all the way back to the 1870s. And so this has been the poorest dry years by far. Normal rainfall downtown is about the same as it is here at Chino. It's about 50 inches a year. And so you can see the total four years is 29. So we've had half our normal rainfall for four consecutive years. But if you go back all the way to 2000, you can see that we've had a couple of wet years in there. 2004, 2005, some good rain. But basically, we've been in drought here for almost 15 years. It's been slowly building. And now, of course, all you hear about is uh, the Godzilla El Nino that's coming. And, you know, many people think of it as the Great White Hope. It's going to bail us out of this drought. All right? But uh, be careful, you know, what you wish for. All right? So, really, the topic here this morning is are you ready for El Nino? And what I'm going to tell you, it's not as bad as advertised. And if you get ready, we're in good shape. So if you read the newspapers or the evening news, all right, you know, it's not the evening news. It's the evening bad news, all right? They never give you good news on the evening news, all right? But it's not true. If we get prepared, this is not going to be as bad as advertised. Now, uh, at, at JPL, we fly satellites that monitor the entire Pacific. So I've been watching this El Nino build really since January. And, and what you see here is an animation of the great event of, many of you remember, the winter of 97, 98. 
where we had twice our normal rainfall. That was a big deal. And so I'm comparing side by side here those two events. And, and you can see that this thing is continuing to build. Not only that, which one of these is largest? In November, right now, 97, or our present event? You can see this present event really is bigger than the 97 event, and it continues to grow. So don't poo-poo it, you know. So the big question is, are we all going to get hosed this winter? Okay. And, and more important, are the Sierras going to get snow packed? Because that's really the drought buster, right? And I think I can pretty much guarantee, knowing what we know about previous El Ninos, you will get a good hosing this winter. Probably normal your double rain, no rainfall. So at this point, this thing is so large, it's not going anywhere in the next couple of months. It's deeply embedded in the ocean. It's about three times the size of the continental United States. So this baby is too big to fail. Now this is how El Nino works. Usually there's a jet stream that goes into the rainforests of Central America, Panama, Southern Mexico. That's why they're so wet. Well, all that warm water, what it does is it shifts that jet stream farther north. And so really beginning usually in January and February, we get like a convoy or a conveyor belt of storms coming out of the west that hit southern central California, and they move across the United States into Texas, and uh, Florida gets a particularly good battery. Now that polar jet stream, the one you always see on the evening news, on the weather report, that gets weaker and moves farther north. And so the northern tier of the United States, which had such punishing winters for the last few years, gets pretty mild. And so uh, what you'll be watching on TV is mudslides in LA and Chino, and they'll be golfing in Minneapolis in February. <laughs> now here's, I always like data, you know, I'm a scientist, I'm a geek. This is the last 70 years of rainfall data from downtown LA. Chino looks pretty much the same. And, and you notice we get some pretty dry years, three or four inches for an entire season. And then we get a few wet years. And in particular, notice the El Ninos of 82, 83, and 97, 98. Interesting. They both gave about 31 inches of rain. So it's double. It's not triple. The other thing, if you look at this long enough, what do you think? There are more, more blue lines below the average or above the average? Low. Low. Okay, yeah, good students. Uh, seven out of ten years in Southern California are drier than normal. Seven out of ten years. So whenever anybody asks me what the, what's going to be the next winter, what do I always say? It's going to be dry. You wish you had those odds in Vegas. Yeah? All right. But as I mentioned earlier, these big El Ninos, or Las Ninos, can double our rainfall. Now what does it look like? Here's a a couple of rain years with El Ninos. The red line is average or normal. That usually never happens, by the way. It's usually drier or wetter. All right? That's just a fiction for my computer. The blue line was the 82, 83 El Nino. And, and uh, it gave 31 inches. And you notice the big months were January and March. Heavy rainfall. All right? We have the you know, about three times our normal rainfall in those two months. But the winter by far was February 1998. Rather than three inches of rain, we had almost 14 inches of rain. So that's four to five times our normal rainfall in one month. So this is sort of what El Nino looks like. January, February, March, sometimes into April and May. But the big months are January, February, and March. Now, this is that month in February. Now, this is interesting, look at it. You know, you get, uh, there are about uh, six days here where you've got between an inch and a half and two inches. 
but not 10 inches. Not 10 inches. And so these were four pretty good sized storms and two little ones. And so that's manageable. So you can see there's 14 days without rain and 14 days with rain. But no days with 10 inches of rain. And so these rains, all right, they tend to be steady during El Nino, not spectacular, which is good news. That means that it is somewhat manageable, except on the freeways, you know, that's the worst space for El Nino. Police department will tell you that, you know. People around here can't drive with an eighth of an inch of rain on the roads, <laughs> all right? But when you're getting an inch every other day, that's where the chaos is, all right? So slow down when you're on the freeways during El Nino, all right? Now we also get these events we call Pineapple Express. Right. And uh, you see that stream of white coming out of the tropics, bullseyeing on California. Those are really big events. For, for instance, uh, just remember just before Christmas, 2010, a couple of weeks there, it just never stopped raining. So, you know, we had uh, 15 inches in Pasadena in 10 days, all right? And, and that was a big rain year. But that's not an El Nino year, all right? So there's the good news. These big, huge atmospheric river or Pineapple Express events don't seem to happen during El Nino. Now here was a flood, all right? People are talking about floods. This was 1938. This is the Los Angeles River, all right? They had 10 inches of rain in one day. So everything south of downtown LA was flooded for three miles on both sides of the river. Irvine was under six feet of water, what is Irvine today? So on, on the basis of that, we decided to put a lot of flood control in Southern California. So the federal government, the state, and local governments have literally since 19, early 1940s, put billions of dollars of flood control in Southern California. Billions, all right, all right. So, uh, as I mentioned, these largest floods are not during Los Ninos, right? But we have lots of infrastructure to prevent us from large-scale regional flooding, all right? That's the good news. A lot of people don't like that. You know, the LA River is 51 miles of concrete, and it's uh, hooked up to 2,600 miles of storm source, all right? But it prevents large-scale regional flooding. Before, before they concrete the LA River, you know, the LA River goes right down to 710. All those communities on the 710 would be underwater. All right. So your problems tend to be local. It's what I call the usual suspects. If you live below a burn area, on a hillside, all right, some place that's got really bad zoning, which by the way is about half of LA, all right. You know what happened back in the winter of 98 or 83. And so you can get ready. You know, your police department and your emergency affair, uh, emergency office people are gonna have sandbags available for you, and the time to do it is now, all right? But one thing I can guarantee, all those 2,600 miles of storm sewers, plus the San Ana and the San Gabriel River, all right? It's gonna be a mess on the beaches. So there goes all the A ratings down from the beaches. All right. all right, I'm wrapping up here, just to make it quick. So anyhow, this Godzilla El Nino, it's a real deal. It'll be sweet, you know, it'll be nice to see a little rain for a while, and it will be somewhat of a down payment on the drought, right? If we survive all the floods and mudslides and you know what happens, all right? A lot of which can be prevented if you think a little bit about the whole thing beforehand, right? But ending where we started, the real drought busters is we need a decade or more of above average rainfall and snowpack. There is no quick fix for the drought. I told you it took us 15 years to get into it, and there's no quick fix. You're going to slowly crawl out of it. 
And the other thing is, is that there's been so much growth and demand for water in Southern California. There's all these great habits that you've developed. I hope you've developed them, you know. You know, cutting back on your watering in your yard and your household use, you know. Myself, I, you know, I never flush the toilet. It scares people when they come to my house. You know? <laughs> that's a lifestyle. We're there forever, all right? So water saving and water conservation are a lifestyle. The good old days are gone. In 1950, there were only 5 million people in Southern California. Now there's more than 20 million. All right. Okay, you know, the last El Nino caused a lot of damage, right? But again, let me repeat it for the 10th time. If you get prepared and you use common sense, all right? I think the police department will appreciate that, especially when you get in your car during these heavy rains and when a lot of the underpasses are flooded. Common sense can save an awful lot of party. And I think probably other people have mentioned this, all right? But, you know, just check up on your property. Those of you that think you need flood insurance and you think it's covered by your homeowner's policy, not true. You have to apply for homeowner's insurance. And it takes 30 days through the federal government, your insurance agent can help you, all right? And then there are a list of other things. And, and uh, you know, I end up here, you know, if you do have problems in your neighborhood, you know, know where your evacuation routes are. So it's a bunch of common sense, small things. And by the way, many of these things, it's good to do in case of an earthquake, all right? Take out your iPhone and take pictures of everything in your house. Take you about a half an hour, then put it on a flash drive. Right. Now I can end with a little good news. You know, I just talked to people in Pasadena yesterday. Right. Now here's an interesting one. The, the, the Rose Parade since 1890, it's only rained 10 times. What's the probability on that, right? But these are the years that it rained, right? And, and, and the good news is, is El Nino has never rained on the Rose Parade. Uh, right? And so the people in Pasadena, that's all they really wanted to know. <laughs> okay, that's it. Again, I apologize for being late and thank everybody for being patient. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Again, please talk to the folks in our resource table. Um, they'll be sticking around for a little bit if you have some more questions. Thank you so much. And a special thanks to the City of Chino, the Police yeah. Department, and Chris Wolves.